hey, how you doing? What a beautiful rainy day it is. A rainy day to learn some history. I'm gonna give you a history lesson here in Staten Island or on Port Richmond, Port Richmond Avenue. Thousands of cars, buses go past this every day without realizing how historic the Dutch Reformed Church is. And we're gonna learn all about it coming up next. My name is Warren McKenzie and I am one of the elders of the congregation here. Well, they came as early as 1650 something. Um, but they didn't permanently settle the island until 1661. The congregation has occupied this site since 1680. Fast forward a couple hundred years, I was actually born into the congregation. My parents were members here um, before I was born, and so I have been here for my entire life. In, in chronological order, we'll begin with Daniel Tompkins. Um, Daniel Tompkins was a governor of New York, and he was also vice president under James Monroe. It was Tompkins who actually donated the piece of land that allowed the church to occupy what in the current building we are now. The building before this actually faced north-south and the congregation did not own the property between the building and the street. So in essence, they were trespassing every Sunday morning when they came to church. Um, so Tompkins donated this piece of land which gave a street frontage um, and Eventually, when they built this building, they were able to build it facing, fronting the street. Tompkins also, at the time, um, lived in what is now known as, as St. George, uh, the Tompkinsville area. And at that time, there was a quarantine station. Um, things were so bad in the quarantine station that Tompkins initiated the pastor of the church here, Peter Van Pelt, um, to begin a ministry down in the quarantine station. And that gave birth to what is now known as the Brighton Heights Reform Church. Every one of the five Reform Church congregations on Staten Island can trace their roots back to this congregation. Um, fast forward a couple centuries later, and they now built this building in 1845. The pastor at the time um, envisioned a new building. They were outgrowing the building that they were in, and the pastor at the time, James Brownlee, um, envisioned a new, bigger, more commodious space, and he was the force behind this, the building of this building. In 1898, they were outgrowing this space, and they had worship space, but they had no meeting rooms, um, Sunday school rooms, they utilized a dirt floor basement underneath us, and any time there was a heavy rain, the basement would flood, and it was not uh, conducive to using it in those times. They then added on the building next door to us, the annex. Um, this building was built without the use of an architect. It was built by a local builder. When they added on the Sunday school addition next door, they did utilize an architect. His name was Oscar Teal. Um, Teal, among other things, was a magician, and he was a contemporary of Harry Houdini. Teal also designed Houdini's tomb. The building next door was built in what's called the Akron Plan, and the Akron Plan was devised by a Sunday school superintendent from Akron, Ohio. Sunday school prior to that time was a one-room affair, all the kids in one place, and the Akron Plan was a plan that came up with a design that allowed each age group to have their own separate space, and those spaces were divided by movable doors um, that either go up or down or fold back, and so at a certain point that all of the uh, room could be used for a general assembly, or in our case, um, as you can tell, it looks like a theater. Uh, Teal supposedly had a love for the old Globe Theater and all of the woodwork up and around the, um, the dome area in the, in the roof of the building uh, is supposed to be evocative of the Old Globe Theater. Filmed out on the street and in a couple of the buildings around us as well. And they began by using us for holding, catering, and uh, hair and makeup. And of course, while they were in here, they decided, wow, this would be a great place to um, shoot a scene, which they did. The scene was um, a political rally that Al Capone comes in and busts up with his gang of thugs. 
uh, the scene that they actually filmed here. Uh, in, during the scene, Capone comes in with a bat in his hand and he hits somebody in the head and the sound of him theoretically smashing the guy in the head was so realistic that they actually won a sound Emmy um, for the scene that they shot here in the building. Currently the church is listed. Um, it's called the Trifecta of Landmarking. We are on the city, state, and national level uh, landmarking. The buildings are listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and they are also New York City landmarks. Interestingly enough, the cemetery which surrounds the building, um, in both cases, city-state, um, the cemetery has enough significance on its own between the people who are buried there and the design of the tombstones that the cemetery has its, its own um, historic landmark status. Well, actually, um, Cornelius' mother uh, was a woman named Phoebe Hand. And Phoebe's father, um, during the in War of Independence, was a British sea captain. Needless to say, British sea captains weren't in good standing here in, on Staten Island during the War for Independence. Um, so he left his daughter in care of her grandmother with a dowry. Uh, the story goes that Grandma squandered the dowry and left poor Phoebe penniless. Uh, Phoebe was taken in by the minister of the church. She was the nanny of his children. And um, she married a Dutch settler here on the island by the name of Van Der Bilt um, and gave birth a few years later to a child named Cornelius. Uh, we all know what happened with Cornelius. Um, he made his fortune here on the local ferry trade um, he was born here in Port Richmond, and uh, we're not sure exactly where he was baptized, but he was baptized by the minister of the church here. Um, we know that his brother was baptized in the church, but we're not sure about Cornelius. These stained glass windows are awesome. Uh, originally, though, the building was built with plain glass windows. Um, the, the windows on the sides of the buildings were added around 1910. Um, the angel window in the front of the sanctuary um, dates from a period before that and interestingly enough we do have um, documentation that the side windows were built by a company named J&R Lamb. Uh, I believe they're in Jersey City or Newark over in New Jersey. Um, they may st actually still be in business. The angel window though there is some controversy around that in that it is supposedly evocative of the style of a man named Mr. Tiffany. Um, we have no documentation though about that, um, so it's a good claim to make, but we're not quite sure that it is. Absolutely. Well, during the, the time of the American Revolution, the church still preached in the Dutch language. Um, and the Dutch were sympathetic to the cause of resistance, as it was known. Um, so in, in essence, the minister of the church was preaching sedition against the English crown right from the pulpit. There was a, an attack on the British stationed here in Port Richmond, and um, in retaliation, supposedly, they burned the church. <laughs> and that's why we had to make another one until we outgrew that one, um, and it's been ongoing ever since. Currently we have 58 families who are uh, on the rolls as worshiping members, and we do worship every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Um, obviously, the being known as the Dutch church is a thing of the past. Um, there is not a lot of Dutch migration here to the north shore of Staten Island anymore. Um, interestingly enough, though, while it is known as the Dutch Church, it has never really been a Dutch congregation. Um, right from the beginning, it was made up of English, French, and Dutch settlers. Um, what makes it the Dutch Church is the things that it was founded on. Um, so the Dutch settlers who came here, um, unlike their Puritan cousins, also came here in part to escape religious persecution. Um, in 
Holland, where they came from, they were granted certain rights to be there um, in terms of the things that they believed in, which were at the time controversial. So the original settlers here to Staten Island believed that they, um, they had the right to be known and to uh, make a living for the things that they could accomplish with their hands, with their skills, and to not be known necessarily by their peerage. Um, so rather than whether they came from a family of nobility, their right to um, health, happiness, and the pursuit of happiness um, should be by their own industry. One thing that is glaringly noticeable is that the settlers who came here in the mid-1600s um, came here with a, a laundry list of things that they believed in and that they wanted to establish here in the country. And most of those things um, turn up a hundred or so years later in something that's called the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence. Um, so we are extremely proud of the roots of the congregation and of the things that they stood for and believed in. One can't help but wonder about the uh, footfalls of history that have gone through here. Um, one of the pastors, James Brownlee, came in a particularly troubling time in the congregation's uh, history. Um, came as a very young man, he was 21 years old, he had just been ordained in Scotland, um, and he came on the recommendation of an uncle of his who was a Reformed Church minister in Manhattan. And he built him as this young firebrand um, who could do great things for the congregation. And shortly after his arrival here, uh, there was a note that went back to the uncle that said, we're not sure that the kid has staying power. Uh, interestingly enough, James Brownlee stayed here for 65 years. Um, his only ministry on Staten Island, um, pastors move around. I think the average length of stay nowadays is less than seven years. So imagine a minister staying for 65 years. Um, so yeah, one can't help but walk through the building and not think about the stories of the people that have been here before. If you would like more information on the Dutch Reformed Church, contact 718-442-7393 or visit olddutchchurchnyc.org.